There are friends, Dave Politis, K9 Missing Project, copyright edition for our video channel. This is a missing persons video, and uh, we've got some cool things to talk about today. And the cases I'm going to give you are mind-bending. I guarantee it. So uh, hang in there. I've got some really good letters, and I've got some uh, interesting things to talk about in the meantime. Somebody sent me this. What it is, it's a rescue streamer. And it says C Rescue Streamer. And what it is, is uh, comes in this little handy dandy belt buckle kind of thing. Put it on your belt, take it out, and it's about a, it's an orange streamer about 10 feet long. I think it could have some good applications, but couple things it's pretty heavy I mean it's heavier than a lot of things I have on my backpack when I'm cooling along or and I don't have a lot of room on my belt because I've got a gun and some other things on my belt so I don't know if, it, if I would put this on my belt the other thing is it's expensive it's 95 bucks now you can buy a personal locator beacon for somewhere between 250 and 300 bucks but again, this thing is a 10 foot long orange banner. Now, if you lay this out, there's a very good chance you will be seen by a helicopter if you're lost and you need help. But as I've stated before, I've talked to a lot of helicopter pilots who've saved a lot of people, and everyone says the same thing. If you're lost in the woods, take your coat off and just twirl it above your head and that will gain the attention of the people in the helicopter, they say. So, I believe that. Now, if I was in a boat, maybe it is waterproof. And if I was cross-country skiing or snowshoeing, this would be good. Because the orange against the white snow, I think it would have a good application. They showed some uh, videos of this, and I encourage you to go look. I think they could have done a better job marketing it, but I, I like the idea. I think they're, they're trying, but $95, a lot of money. So, for the people that sent it to me, thank you, and I'll continue to review the stuff. And I got something really cool today from a man named Fred. Hey Dave, thought you might enjoy this. It's a photo of Huck that I took with my phone from one of your recent videos. I watched them all. The other is a poem I wrote several years ago when my best friend was 12. His name was Brutus. He was a miniature dox, dachshund. Dox hound? He lived another two years before he was called home. Losing my best friend after only 14 years was hard. Nothing in comparison to losing a son, but still hard. I would have loved to have met Ben. God willing, someday I'll meet him. Shake your hand. And I'd like to meet you. The gift is just a simple way of saying thank you, not only for being a dog lover, but for your quest and finding the answer to the missing people. Keep up the great work. So I'm going to show this to you what Fred did. It's pretty impressive. Here's the poem. Dogs bring joy no matter what the breed, small ones, large ones, and those in between. This wonderful gift we are given from above, there is nothing quite like a dog's endless love. They are happy to see you whenever you are there, jumping up and down, tails wagging in the air. The short lives that they live, they are always your friend. They will never betray you. They are loyal to the end. If I had but one wish and God were here and God were to hear, it would be to let all dogs live just a few more years. Fred, that is epically good. Thank you so much. It's a good picture of Huck too. Huck is in a uh <laughs> A wild mood tonight, I'd say. We were uh, we're in there next room watching some TV, and I was going through my notes, 
And she was yapping and barking and we live in a very quiet area. Not a lot of things around. And when something cracks, something, an unusual sound, she is our alert. And I've told many of you that dogs are great to have in the wilderness. And uh, for that, that reason, she can smell things we'll never smell, hear things we won't hear, and see things many times that we won't see. But start off with a lot of comments this week about different videos that people watch. I've talked to you about being a critical thinker, a critical thinker. It bothers me sometimes when people talk about these videos they watch and I know right away they're completely bogus and no name of the person who's talking, no name of the location where it happened, no date. It's somebody just telling a story to get you to watch. And that's what a lot of these YouTube channels are about. It's not about credibility and integrity. It's about getting you wrapped up to spend time watching the channel because YouTubers like me are compensated based on how long you watch our videos. So when you go through them real quick, yeah, it doesn't help us. If you turn them on and watch them and do your housework and listen in the background, that helps. If people can just BS you into listening, they've won. And that's what that's what really bothers me because the bar is lowered on YouTube, it seems like, just to entertain people. And it, it does bother me a lot. Um, there's a lot of cryptid shows out there. And I know a lot of them. And people have asked, why don't you go on them? Because there aren't many of them out there that are credible at all. And I don't want to go on the show and uh, put forth my name with something that I know that they're going to do a show next week that's not true. How do I know that? Because I've known people that have been on these shows that were co-hosts and left because of that exact reason. That's all I could say about it. I do appreciate you guys telling me about people that are impersonating me and using the 411, missing 411 brand. It shows that they don't have an imagination, they don't have the wherewithal to do their own research, and they're just trying to live on my heels. There's nothing really I can do about it. The best thing that can happen is you, as the viewer, make comments on their, on their show about, hey, the real Dave Politis and Missing 411 can be found at blah, 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 this site, and put a link up to my site. The other thing, a lot of people have said that uh, they've been unsubscribed from the channel. That is really frustrating. It's hard enough to get people to watch. And then when you like it and you want to subscribe and then they unsubscribe you, oh God, there's no worse nightmare for, for somebody like me. It's hard to get people to follow you. And once you get them, you want to keep them. Missing 411, The UFO Connection, our third movie. It's uh, out there, you could rent and it's hardly anything to rent it now. Please go out and watch it. And then, if you do watch it, go out and put up a uh, review. I've stated before, I, there's nothing more frustrating in my life than the re re read the one-star reviews on Amazon. A one-star review will annihilate my overall reviews on Amazon. I had a solid five star review for the first four months. And then all of a sudden, there were these series of one star reviews that just annihilated me. And you read them and it's like, they didn't even watch the movie. I would say 80% of the one star comments make no sense to me. And I, and I try to be open minded about what people are saying, but it's like they didn't even watch it. It's as though they're getting paid to just take down the overall review level of this movie. So, yeah, frustrating. 
But many of you have put up many kind comments and I am appreciative to no end for that. People say, well, I don't know how to make a comment on Amazon. You can, anything you buy on Amazon, you can go put a comment on it. If you go onto your account on Amazon, top right corner, click on it, and then it'll show all the purchases you made, my purchases, and then you click on that, right next to it, it'll say review this item. And you can go right on and review it. So, if you do, appreciate it. So let's get into some of these letters. And there's some really good ones. Hey Dave, we have the same exact UFO you showed in your video a couple weeks ago. Angie and I were looking out the window and wow, something weird out there that's not normally there. So I just pulled out my uh, phone, took a video of it, and showed it on one of the uh, shows I did. You can watch it right here on this channel. Just look at the screen, right where it says the Canine Missing Project, click on that, then click on videos, and it'll give you all the videos, 450 plus videos you can watch it. It says uh, you described exactly what ours does, our UFO does, and your video looks just like ours. Locals in Kenai, Alaska call it the disco ball. We see it all the time. Sometimes it's stationary. Other times it seems like a child that can't sit still. It knows when it's being watched. Promise you that. Don't know how, but it knows. There's a man out there named Stephen Greer, Dr. Stephen Greer. And he proposes a system whereby you can think about a UFO. You meditate and you can bring UFOs in and they'll come up and show up in your sky. He proposes that all UFOs are good. There's no bad ones. So, what I'm saying is, is that if you believe in a system, and I know a lot of people that do, that don't believe in his thinking about UFOs, but believe in a system of meditation and bringing them in, many of those people say, well, you can bring them in and you can watch them yourself. And the point being is that it's almost as though they know what you're thinking and when you're thinking and how you're thinking about them. Which is pretty interesting if you, if you sit down and put some thought to that. Next letter, hey Dave, good afternoon, Huck and all villagers. I just got done listening to yesterday's video regarding missing cases from the UK, Canada, and Illinois. I've long been a fan of your work and feel compelled to share something what happened when I lived in my home state of Illinois. I was a fan of hiking and state parks local to me. I had a very high pressure job as a traveling nurse and getting out in nature with my dog was like medicine for me. Medicine for me too. In fact, the event that I'm writing about is what made me aware of your work. This event, this event scared me in a way that I've never been scared before. Despite coming in from an abusive home, being a cop in the military and encountering some scary people on the job, I don't spook easily and have a pretty good intuition. It was a sunny and somewhat cool afternoon when I left home to go hiking at a state park about 15-20 minutes from my house. This was a park that I felt comfortable at, so I had hiked it many times and also considered a second office of mine. I would nap in my car, eat lunch, and do paperwork phone calls there. The park sits alongside the Illinois River and had an associated lock and dam. What did I just talk about the other day? The Illinois River. There's a bridge that is close by that goes to a nearby small town. I had a funny feeling as, of dread as I got closer to the park. My dog wasn't exactly herself either. She'd usually be excited and sort of yipping. I pushed the feelings of dread back and parked at the parking area that I usually stopped at. It has a restroom and a picnic pavilion. There's sort of an inclined path that leads to the RV park. I was going to hike through the RV park and then come back. I opened up a hatch on my RV to leash up the dog. You can usually barely get the leash on her because she would spin herself in circles. 
the dread was getting worse with me. I kept getting, kept going because I couldn't identify the source of my fear. Stupid, I know. Stop right there. Someone, something, somewhere is giving you a message. Pay attention to the message. There's other parks, there's other dates, there's other times. Don't push it. Get back in the car and leave. We got about 100, 150 yards down the path and my dog isn't running ahead on point. She stuck to my side and then began walking behind me. It then dawned on me that the normal sounds I was used to hearing weren't there. No sounds from the nearby town, traffic or bridge, animals in the bush, birds chirping, stone cold silence. Item number two, you should have been paying attention. 180, back to the car. My hair went up and the little voice inside me said, you gotta leave now. Again, that's, that's number three. I know better than to run. I acted like I got a phone call and had to leave so that at least I could have the phone in my hand. I also felt like I was watched. I loaded the dog back up quickly without taking her leash off. I didn't feel better until I made the turn out of the park. I never went back there again. Some months later, while poking around the internet, I found a website that details Bigfoot sightings. There were Bigfoot sightings in that very close area and also at another state park I used to hike at. I spent a lot of time on the Illinois River growing up as my parents had a houseboat. That'd be fun. My friends and I would go out exploring when we would tie off the boats at an island on the river. We would have bonfires, have a light source, cook. Never did we encounter anything strange. I appreciate your talks about mental health. Being a nurse, it isn't so hard to see the impact that mental health has had on so many of us in our lives. It's sad that for the lost potential on a personal and societal basis, it costs nothing to treat others the way you would like to be treated and help one another. We can achieve, we can achieve so much when we come together. Glad to have this like-minded village. Thank you for reading. My two German Shepherds would like to send Huck a friendly bark. Well, thank you. Huck barks back. <laughs> a couple things to think about. First of all, I'm glad it took number three to get you to turn around and come back. I wish it would have been number one. Because how many times have people who have disappeared had that same feeling? And didn't get the opportunity to get to number two and number three. Good question, huh? Now, this person was a nurse. A giving individual. Yeah, I've been in the hospital a few times. Once when I broke my leg really bad, had to have surgery. One of the first doctors I ever saw said, man, you're going to walk with a limp your whole life because that can't be fixed. Ended up having a friend in the Bay Area California Bay Area in San Francisco who knew one of the 49er doctors I got referred to him he looked at it and he said I can fix that you'll walk just like new I said really he goes oh yeah and I went to him and he did a great job but I was in the hospital for it I think 36 hours after that because it was pretty big surgery and uh, I remember a nurse came in these people don't know you I don't know anything about you. And the way they treat you is like gold. And I remember thinking after I left that hospital, wow, those people treated me like I was their best friend, their close relative. Imagine, imagine if we all just treated people we didn't know like that. And you can say, well, they're paid to do that. No, they're, they're not paid to do that. You know, they can do a job and they can be nice, but I've had some nurses that were just really, really good people. And uh, I live with a nurse. <laughs> yes, Angie is a nurse, an RN. And she is that way, a very giving person. So I'm very appreciative of nurses. And I'm, I very much appreciate the way they treat people. I wish we all did treat people like that 
Hey Dave, I just wanted to reach out and let you know how much we've been enjoying the Bigfoot 101 series, especially the latest episode. We actually live in Greensburg and have seen Stan speak at the festival in Kecksburg. It was very cool to hear more about Chestnut Ridge from, this is in Pennsylvania, from another perspective as we've seen most of the documentaries all out there. Really enjoy your channel in general and if you ever make it out to Kecksburg, we'd love to see you. Well, Stan runs the Kecksburg UFO conference and it's a volunteer, it's a, oh, what's the right word? It's a ch kind of a charity conference for the local volunteer fire department. And he invited me out this year to be one of the speakers. Unfortunately, we had a conflict with some family events during that time. Otherwise, I would have went. And we're going to talk about this area, as a matter of fact, tonight in, in detail. So hold your taters. It's coming. But uh, Stan, great guy. Very humble. Very knowledgeable. As I've stated in my Bigfoot series, one of the very few researchers that has my utmost respect. So if you can, look, Google the Kecksburg, Pennsylvania UFO conference and get out there. It's a really good time. Hey Dave, we're on a flight back to Wyoming after a week in Washington, D.C. Oh my gosh, I can't think of a more yin and yang <laughs> Washington, D.C. and Wyoming. Oh boy, I spent a lot of time in Wyoming. I love that state. Washington, D.C., don't want to go. Yuck. <clears throat> I was overwhelmed visiting all the memorials displaying huge engravings such as Freedom Isn't Free. Eternal vigilance is the price of liberty and the entire Declaration of Independence. Yet half of our population is blindly allows the opposite of those ideals to become their standards. Very sad. I wonder why I'm writing. I've been studying alchemy recently, which brought of the Masons, which brought up DMT. Here's a summary of thoughts I had in connection to your book, Sobering Coincidences. Missing 411, Sobering Coincidence. By the way, don't ever buy my book at Amazon or eBay. You'll get ripped off. They're charging three or four times what I charge on my website. I charge $24.99 for my books. Website. N-A, like North America, BigfootSearch.com. N-A, like North America, BigfootSearch.com. Then go to the online store. Alchemy, another word for magic, in my opinion, was is practiced by the Masons. An attempt to produce magnum opus, the ultimate transformation of your cellular, cellular makeup to transcend dimensions. Your body produces high levels of DMT. This is believed to be the most difficult process highly sought after. Alchemists had perfectly squared rooms with no windows, so they could sit in the darkness meditating for days. Reminds me of a few quite megalithic wonders. Finally, light was introduced to the person which would create a chemical reaction to the body that increases DMT in the spinal fluid. This is very similar to the ayahuasca, which we've all heard celebrities partaking and saying they've met God or Satan as a result. I'm sure there's more to the process than the casual reader would learn about. Also, commonly known, turning lead into gold is just a byproduct of particular spell. It's not the actual goal. Story right here. Stop. Aaron Rodgers, quarterback today for the Green Bay Packers. I don't think he's coming back next year. Aaron and I went to the same school. Both went to Berkeley. Both grew up in California. Tom Brady <laughs> grew up about 20 miles north of me in San Mateo. Well, Aaron Rodgers, you don't s probably see a lot of interviews with him, but super smart man, super smart. Uh, he does some things that some people would say weird. He's tried ayahuasca and he just got back from sitting in a room in a darkened room for four hours, I'm sorry, for four days. And he was meditating. And he says he was trying to get some answers about his future. That's why this played into exactly what this person said. So bringing it back to your work, the thought occurred to
to me that other humans, organizations, and governments are trying to successfully transcend to another dimension or open portal through alchemy. Since they haven't perfected the process they are practicing on others, the missing that are gone for several days, days seemingly still alive during that time according to coroners, suddenly found in water or locations previously searched, no sign of drowning or other causes of death, and high levels of DMT. Could they be victims of alchemists practicing to open a portal? This is a very basic rundown of my theory on alchemy and DMT. I felt there is a real possibility here. I'm still trying to learn about these topics though. Maybe if you share this email, someone out there can help fill in the blanks quicker. Villagers can understand further by doing a basic read up on alchemy, DMT, Masonic temples, and the Knight Templars. Or you can watch Oak Island and learn more about them as well. I'm practicing something you said a while ago. Know a little about a lot instead of a lot about a little. That's why I even started reading up on alchemy. I have a feeling alchemy is very important to the shadow government elitists. Okay, Dave, that's all I got. I hope I conveyed it clearly to you, and I hope this is, opens up some new avenues to look down. Enjoy this crazy winter we are having. Always, God bless. It's crazy. Next letter. Hey, hi, Dave, Angie, and Hawk. I wanted to tell you about an experience I had with an orb after I had been attacked. But what I believe to be a djinn, D-J-I-N-N. -N. I was asleep and I woke up with the feeling of choking. I sat up and was coughing my brains out hysterically only to see a black smoke-like figure emanating to or from my mouth. I was absolutely terrified and basically thought it was death that had come to take me. I was coughing like crazy and staring at the thing and only could see reddish eyes in an otherwise odd looking shape almost triangular in appearance as it was trying to take my breath away and in and out of my mouth. Whatever it was kind of dissolved and looked like it had shrunk in on itself and disappeared. I've wondered since the incident if it came from within or went inside me to take my soul or something. Needless to say, it took quite some time to get back to sleep. But when I awoke, I saw a blue orb above me in the corner where the ceiling meets the corner of the wall. It seemed to be rotating but did not move. The inside seemed to be like swirling white. I observed the orb for two or three minutes and it never changed size or moved. It was about six inches in diameter if I had to guess. I tried talking to it and turning lights on and off trying to get a reaction. Finally, when I turned to hit the light switch one last time, it disappeared. I've been searching for info ever since the incident happened in 2009. I got completely overwhelmed with how fairly common these things happen. I just wanted to point out some differences I noticed in my experience compared to others. I believe there are other dimensions that these things are beyond our comprehension, travel through and create this phenomena. For what purpose remains a big question. This is not my first experience with paranormal events as I was witnessing what some would refer to as the hat man at a young age. Keep up the good work, Dave. My girlfriend and I enjoy all your books, movies, and of course the priceless YouTube content. Well, of course it's priceless, yes. <laughs> Thank you for the kind words. I appreciate it. Next letter. Hey, Dave. I've been following you for several years now ever since I heard you on Coast to Coast. You know, it's amazing. How many people watch Coast to Coast? It is amazing. You can watch it. Yes, you can on YouTube or you can listen to it. And they're on dozens and dozens of stations across the US and Canada. Thank you for discussing mental health and doing what you feel led to do on your channel. I've referred a good friend to NAMI, N-A-M-I, and I have and will continue to find opportunities to encourage everyone around me to get off the devices and get into the real world for real life connection. If you're having a mental health episode but you're in control get into a NAMI class N-A-M-I they will help I've done it I went through a 12 week class best class I ever took anyways I want to share a few strange stories with you as well as some things I learned upon reflecting the first four story correct that the, um, 
They all happened at the same place in Angola, New York, right next to Lake Erie. All the stories have a woods and water connection, except one. First one, I was walking up the road to my mom's house. On her left are houses, only five in the whole street. Behind her is the main road and woodland that leads right to Lake Erie. To her right is the woods. This is the only small woodland area, a quarter mile thick. My mom is walking home and she sees a small silver metallic cigar shaped object in the woods to her right. It was just sitting on the ground, only about eight feet long. She walked closer to it and then was suddenly just walking home again. Her mother was waiting for her at the front door and she was annoyed that she was coming home at dusk. My mom was super confused because she remembered the sun being overhead before seeing the strange object which was gone now looking back. She was only three houses away from her home. This was her only instance of missing time, but she did remember the whole neighborhood being up in an uproar since the strange thing was sighted in the sky and was scar shaped. This would have been in the 60s and 70s. My mom's story number two. This took place at the same house, same street as the story above. My dad and mom were in his truck. I was in Utero and my mom frightened was frightened because my dad was drunk and angry, muttering terrible things and pounding the steering wheel. She was afraid he had hurt her, as he had in the past, and afraid now that he would hurt me if he were to hit her in the stomach. So you were in the utero. So she prayed. She needed time to get out of her seatbelt and unlock the door. Suddenly my dad looked straight ahead towards the very few trees that were on the one side of the driveway, and he's freaking out. What are they? What do they want? His eyes were wide with fright. He was transfixed. My mom looked and saw nothing, and a voice in her shouted, Go! This gave my mom to get out, time to get out and get to safety. Grandma's story. Uh, this happened at the same place. She was sitting on a chair out in the lawn when suddenly she saw 10 to 14 cats come out of the woods across the street. These cats proceed to sit in a circle, and one cat walks around them in the middle as if addressing these cats. After a few times walking around the middle, all the cats shot out in different directions. Weird. Yeah, that's weird. I'd say that. <laughs> My bizarre happening. Same place, same woods. My great uncle Jimmy took me on a walk through the woods across the street one day. It was a roundabout way to walk to the park next to Lake Erie. We're walking through and he reminds me not to step in the old food cellar, a hole in the ground now covered by a thin piece of uh, plywood. I was around 10 to 12 at the time. My uncle is like 15 feet in front of me. When we get to a clearing, clearing, when I see a house, or maybe it was a storage building, not quite sure. I can barely remember what it looks like, but I do remember that it just had four steps up, a lawn porch that went to the length of the structure, and peeling red paint, but I can't remember any windows. My uncle took no notice, and although I was curious, I knew just to keep on walking. I kept my eyes on it the whole time and almost tripped. I didn't mention it to him, and I'm not sure why I didn't, but when I got home, I asked my grandma, who lives in that house in the woods? She told me there was no house back there, but at one time there was a home with an old orchard. That's where they had found the old wagon wheels and they put a mark there. I went back there, no house, no clearing. I think now that I somehow had a glimpse into the past, couldn't tell you. These are some strange woods there, ma'am. <laughs> Over by Lake Erie. Yeah, those are strange. Next letter. Hey Dave, if I recall correctly, I was watching your three for one big three for one Bigfoot class. I don't know what that means. Or perhaps your video immediately before you were relating reading a story in which a lady said that she had watched an orb or a hovering light in some distance, looked away for a split second, perhaps distracted, and when she looked back to where the anomaly had previously been floating, clearly visible, it was gone. How many hundreds of times have we heard similar stories? Maybe thousands. It struck me that there's a correlation between contact and visibility. Contact is established visually, so not surprisingly, contact is broken when eye contact is broken. Can an object disappearing while being observed be caused as simply as by blinking one's eye. 
Usually, the more we stare, the more we strain and dry our eyes, necessitating a longer blink to moisturize and lubricate the eyeballs. Just thinking out loud. Were contact made electrically, as opposed to visually, to say nothing of psychically, dropping the connection would be more easily understood were there but a nearly immeasurably short interruption in that connection. Magnetic switches do not allow power to resume when interrupted. The connection must be reestablished. I must wonder what would happen if someone viewing a glowing anomaly would blink only one eye so that the full visual sighting would not be interrupted. Would it disappear? If so, when? If not, when? Good idea. Another thing to think about as far as how easily visual contact once established is broken is how so many people do not see what the other sees. What is the difference between the two persons? Insulation, resistance, or simply one being a conductor of that force, whatever it might be? It could be a physical explanation. Thank you for your time to put your, this into your studies and videos, plus your time you spent on this. Personal message. I receive a YouTube by cable and cannot see any comments, especially the pinned comment below. No, nor can I like or subscribe. It's like watching TV. I really have no idea what is going on with subscription. I would definitely subscribe to your channel and Steve's and a select few others were I able to do so. Your videos and Steve's always pop up as recommended based upon my viewing history. I check both of your channels every day whether I see any recommendations or not. Hmm. So, I always watch YouTubes on a computer. And I always see the comments. I subscribe so I don't I'm not sure about what this lady just explained I don't know how to overcome it I would say probably go to your phone or go to your computer and do it that way it's best I could tell you so what I'm gonna talk to you tonight as far as missing people Pretty unusual, <laughs> to say the least. We're just going to talk about one part of one state, an area south east of Pittsburgh in Pennsylvania. I talked about this area the other day, and I'm coming back to it again with two other cases you've never heard of, with a little more background on the area so you'll understand. Let me start off with, have you ever heard of the Kecksburg UFO? Talked about it earlier in the Kecksburg UFO conference. So Kecksburg, southeast of Pittsburgh. Let me read you what one site says about this. On the evening of December 9th, 65, a large brilliant fireball was seen in at least six U.S. states and Ontario, Canada as it streaked over Detroit, Michigan, Windsor, Ontario area. Reports of hot metal debris over Michigan and northern, northern Ohio and grass fires and sonic booms in the Pittsburgh metro area were attributed to the fireball. Some people in the village of Kecksburg, about 30 miles southeast of Pittsburgh, recorded, reported wisps of blue smoke, vibrations, and a thump. And also that something from the sky had crashed in the woods. An early story in the Greensburg Tribune Review stated the following. The area where the object landed was immediately sealed off by order of the U.S. Army and state police officials in anticipation of a close inspection of whatever may have fallen. State police officials then ordered the area roped off to await the expected arrival of U.S. Army engineers and possibly civilian scientists. When state troopers and Air Force personnel searched the woods, they found absolutely nothing. A subsequent edition of the Tribune bore the headline, Searchers Failed to Find an Object. Authorities discounted proposed explanations such as a plane crash, errant missile test, or re-entering satellite debris, and generally assumed it to, to be a meteor. 
Astronomer Paul Anier said the fireball was likely to have been a meteor entering the Earth's atmosphere. Geophysicist George blah 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 discounted speculations that it was debris from satellite and agreed that the reports were probably just a meteor. Okay. Those reports are questionable at best. Several witnesses said that there was a giant flatbed truck that was being run by the Army where they put something and covered it on the back of that flatbed truck. So reports that they found nothing, eh, questionable. So that's Kecksburg, Pennsylvania. So let's start there. The story is about 40 miles from Kecksburg, this, this first one. And it involves a boy named Lester Kofnauer. Kofnauer, two years old. This happened September 20th, 1935 in Juanita, Juanita Township, Pennsylvania. Now this is 10 miles east of what happened 9-11-01 at Shanksville, Pennsylvania. It's all happening in the same area. United Flight 93 from Newark to San Francisco, 44 people on board, crashed in Shanksville, it was reported. There was an article, February 28, 2012, in the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. This is important, folks. Said Somerset County Coroner Wallace Miller was mystified Tuesday by reports out of Washington, D.C., that unidentified human remains recovered from Flight 93 crash site had been incinerated and dumped in a landfill. Hmm. Miller said, where they would have gotten those remains, I have no idea. The only remains that left Somerset County were samples that were sent for DNA testing to the Air Force, their Institute of Pathology. Hmm. Well, there wasn't a lot found at the site, folks. But a half mile from the crash site, friends, that's 2,600 feet from the crash site, they found one engine. And the FBI said that when it crashed, the engine bounced off the ground and flew a half mile to this other site. Fascinating. Fascinating. So now I've given you two really unusual things that have happened in this area where Lester, a two-year-old, disappeared. Now, the Kofnauers lived in a really rural area. And Mr. Kofnauer had lunch with his kids and his wife and then he walked out into the woods to cut wood. And his daughter and his son went with him. And the daughter was told to watch the son. Well, as a, the dad was cutting woods, just a couple minutes later, not long, the daughter told him, hey, I can't find Lester, he's gone. Well, this is part of the Allegheny Mountains near Somerset. Mr. and Mrs. Kofnauer looked for Lester for a couple hours. And then they ran around as far as they could to get more assistance. The following morning, neighbor calling neighbor, calling neighbor, they ended up getting 150 volunteers in this super rural area of Pennsylvania. They got fire, police, and government workers to take time off of work and look for this little boy. Let me show you this. It's a map, kind of an overview of the entire scenario I'm telling you about. This is Kecksburg. Now Pittsburgh's up here. So Kecksburg, UFO, whatever it was. Shanksville, the crash. And Lester's disappearance. Bing, 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 okay. Well, the local sheriff 
was on site helping to search. He was there almost 24 seven for the entire search event. And many people during the night were carrying torches, looking around, staying out all night, calling Lester's name. Well, the next morning, Sheriff David Calhoun, who had searched Lester's home three times himself, and with 150 searchers concentrating within that area around their cabin, he allowed some of the searchers to tear out the floor in the family's cabin to ensure that the boy wasn't dead underneath the floorboards. Well, that's pretty serious, friends. Well, he wasn't there. The sheriff said the boy wasn't in the area that they were searching. He guaranteed it. And he wasn't, he said that the boy's not old enough to get out of that area because the area around this cabin was very rough and very rugged and no boy that age could go more than a mile or two. Well, this was 1935. The sheriff was very smart because search and rescue manuals say 95% of the time a two-year-old is going to be found in a radius of two, mile or two miles or less from the point they were last seen, which was the area right around the cabin in this wood chopping area. Well, the sheriff was putting the coffin hours under suspicion. He was questioning them and still searching the house and searchers were in the field. And that noon, and at noon, the following day, one of the searchers left to go have lunch. He was the closest neighbor. His name was George Miller. And George lived about six miles from the Coffin House cabin. And if you can imagine this scenario, he gets to his cabin and Lester's been gone about 26 hours. Nobody's at his cabin other than him. He walks in, sits down to have lunch, and he hears like a strange sound outside. And that's all he said, strange sound. Gets up, walks over, and he sees Lester in his backyard. He can't believe it. So he goes out and gets the boy, puts him in his car and drives over to the Coffin Hour residence and hands the boy over to his mom. Now this is Lester and his mom. Pay close attention to his feet. The entire time he's gone, he's not wearing any shoes, per the sheriff. He's gone a total of about 30 hours. The articles state that the boy walks six miles over the top of a mountain Article stated, quote, he was too young and too dazed to tell a coherent story. But he did say that he ate tea berry, tea berry leaves. A physician examined Lester. He said he was in almost perfect health. Let's think about that. Missing 30 hours. No access to food and water. He should have been at least majorly dehydrated. No mention of that. For a two-year-old to know about eating tea berry leaves? That's, that's something, folks. So the allegation. He covered six miles in about 30 hours over the top of some of the most rugged area of Pennsylvania that the, the sheriff said a two-year-old could not, could not make it over the top. Which is why he was suspecting the parents of something because the boy wasn't in the area around the cabin. I've got to, I've got to side with the sheriff on this. What happened? 
how could something like this evolve? And you know me, I'm always looking at the feet. Well, they did say that Lester had some scratches on him. There was never any mention that his feet were raw or cut up. So that boy supposedly made it all that distance in bare feet and his feet never hurt so bad that he just sat down and refused to go on? Sorry, folks. That dog don't hunt. I don't believe it. But that's the story. And that was story number one. Now, in the same area, just, just north of where Lester disappeared, this is where he disappeared, just north, there's a story about the Cox boys. And I gotta tell you, it's a pretty confined area right here, cluster zone. A lot of strangeness in this area. The story's a lot older. April 24th, 1856, a very well-documented story. George Seven and Joseph Five Cox lived in a very remote area called Spruce Hollow, Pennsylvania. They had a small cabin with a family dog. Now, the way the story gets laid out really sparked my interest from the very beginning. Starts off with, on April 24th, the family is sitting having breakfast. The family's dog is named Sport. And Sport starts going crazy inside the house. Barking, running, stacking nuts. Well, the Cox's dad, his name was Samuel, he grabs his rifle and he goes out to check on what's going on outside. And he's there outside searching for almost an hour. He comes back and his wife is going crazy now herself because she says, I don't know how, but George and Joseph just disappeared. Well, that's pretty weird. It's a pretty strange set of coincidences right there that happened. Well, Cox's search the whole day. And near the end of the day, they start going to neighbors to get help. And about midday after this all starts to happen, the weather starts to turn and it starts to snow. And by nighttime, the snow's getting heavier. Well, they do get 150 neighbors to come over and they start searching the entire area. By the next morning, Rumors have already started to fly around Spruce Hollow. These are all documented. This is unbelievable. Some of the rumors is that both boys were killed by a man-eating beast that was seen in the area. I couldn't make this up, folks. I couldn't make this up. This was April 1856. Another rumor is that the boys drowned. There's a creek and some lakes in the area, and they thought, oh, maybe the boys drowned. Okay, and water in the area, that makes sense. There's another allegation that the boys were murdered by the parents. Now you say, well, Dave, that's pretty coincidental. You just said that in the last story. So I'm going to tell you this. When the sheriffs and police are investigating a disappearance in a family, and they don't find any evidence about what really might have happened, they always start turning to the parents or a spouse. It always happens that way. I can't tell you the number of times I was involved in things where I was embarrassed by what some detectives did, but again, Cox family did the same thing. Their floorboards of their house were torn up too, looking for the kids. Now, there are many people missing in this area, so this isn't totally unusual. 
But for this early in the 1800s, it's one of the first cases I've ever had that really matched the profile in this area. Now the neighbors started to get upset because it had snowed. They'd been searching for six days and they hadn't found one footprint of the kids missing in that entire area. Now, George, the seven-year-old, was described by friends and family as being super smart. Keep that in mind. Intellect. Well, they searched 10 days nonstop for the two boys. And boy, I got to give it to the neighbors and family and friends. That's, that's a Herculean effort for 1850s, even for today. Well, on the 10th night, something weird happens. A man named Jacob, Jacob Dilbert, who lived 13 miles from the Coxes, he had this recurring dream for three consecutive nights. Let's stop there for a sec. For villagers who have been with me for a couple years, you know how many times I've talked to you about dreams people have about missing people? Yeah, a lot. Where does the idea for these dreams come from? Is there some remote source that gives the information to this person? Is God somehow messaging this individual to go help and find them? Is there an angel messaging this person? Because folks, Something is messaging these individuals. You can't have these dreams and find somebody on your own. I'm sorry. Especially since this person never claimed they were psychic. Well, the third night that Jacob Dilbert has this dream, it bothers him so bad, he gets a hold of some relatives. And he tells them, I've had the same dream three nights in a row. I've got to do something. And he said, in the dream, there were some landmarks a stream, some large boulders, a log. And he goes, I think I've been to this place and I think I know where it is. So he gets one of the relatives, one of his relatives to go with him. And they leave really early one morning. And by midday, they make it to the spot. And the spot is six miles from the Cox residence and at the time, they said it was in a location that there's no way the boys could have gotten over this giant creek that is between the house and where they were found. Keep that in mind. Well, they get there and they find the boys deceased, both of them. And they get authorities there. And they were described as emaciated and the thought was that they'd been dead for three to four days. They were described as thin. They were found far outside of any search zone you can imagine. Now, one of Jacob's dreams was the boys were found right at the base of a giant stump. When he gets to the location, right next to some boulders and a creek. And there's a giant tree laying down and it's stumps sticking up straight perpendicular to the ground. And where are the boys? Right next to the stump. The doctors at the time said that the boys had been alive five to six days after they disappeared. Well, that's it's pretty hard to believe for me, if it was snowing, young boys don't do well in very inclement cold weather. So the thought that Joseph and George survived in this super cold weather for five to six days, wow. I don't quite understand why they did die. And they thought, you know, maybe it was starvation or exhaustion. Well, they had water because they were right next to a creek. Boys, people, 
They don't die simultaneously. Nobody does. And my best guess would be that George at seven, bigger, stronger, healthier than Joseph at five, would have lived longer. So why were the boys found together? That's very odd, very odd. It reminds me of the stories in Missing 411, A Sobering Coincidence, where somebody gets a large dose of something, and in the book I describe it as GHB, and you lay down, or they put you down, and you can't move while you're under the influence of this, and you end up dying from hypothermia because you can't move. And if the boys are found together, this is really the only scenario that makes sense to me. Because again, if one of the brothers did die, then the surviving brother would probably move on from there looking for help and trying to survive. A very, very sad and confusing situation. As I was writing this story, and, and it's in the, my books, I kept thinking of the Coxes losing two boys. Unbelievable. But let's go back to the beginning of the story. They're at the breakfast table. The dog's going crazy, barking. Something's going on outside. What was that? I, I always have said that kids disappear from homes or ranches. The majority of the time, the dad isn't there. So what happens in this situation? You have point of separation. The dad leaves the home. That leaves the mom and the boys. Somehow or another, those boys disappeared. How could that be? There was never an adequate explanation for that. And it could be because the mom never knew. But those are the stories. I'm gonna give you the map again and let you look at it because it is important. So this is Somerset, Pennsylvania. And I've talked to you about that in a prior video just recently. Kecksburg, Pittsburgh's up here. This is where Lester disappeared, and this is where the Cox boys disappeared. The distance from here to here, about 20, 25 miles. This is all very close. And there's other disappearances in this area that I've written about. This area is very, very strange. So friends, villagers, thank you for being here. Thanks for watching the video. Please share this on your social media sites. Make sure you're subscribed. If you like the video, give me a thumbs up. That's really important. And uh, Missing 411, the UFO connection. Important video movie to watch. And I've got two others you can watch out there too. Missing 411 and Missing 411, The Hunted. We have three documentaries out there right now you can watch. So, be nice to your neighbors, be nice to your friends and family. Hopefully I will see you very soon. Politis, out.